Good afternoon, class. We are looking at chapter two limits, section 2.3, limits of functions at finite numbers. We looked at limits of sequences, section 2.1, limits of functions at infinity, section 2.2, and now 2.3 limits of functions at finite numbers. A quick reminder of what we covered. A sequence is an order list of numbers or function f whose domain is the set of natural numbers, one, two, three, to infinity. Limit refers to the long-term behavior of a sequence, i.e. what happens to a sub n of a sequence in the long run. Uh, when we have the limit of a sub n as n approaches infinity equals l, we say that a sub n converges to l. If that limit ends up being infinity, negative infinity or DNE stands for does not exist, we say the sequence diverges. And in short, to find limits, we simply plug in the value and observe. There are a couple of theorems we discussed. Uh, we should remember them. The limit of r to the power of n as n approaches infinity depends on the base r if it's between negative one and one becomes zero if it's one is one and if it's larger than one becomes infinity the limit of one over n to the power of a p as n approaches infinity is zero if p is larger than zero in other words when the denominator gets larger and larger and larger a fraction such as this one gets closer and closer to zero a geometric se sequence uh, a r to the power of n minus uh, one, if we add them up, becomes a geometric se series, a plus a times r plus a r squared and so forth, has this sum a times one minus r to the power of n over one minus r. And if we want to take a limit of this expression and let n go to infinity, if r is between negative one and one, according to this, when r is between negative one and one, r to the power of n goes to zero, and it becomes a over one minus r. The recursive format for a geometric sequence b sub n plus one is r b sub n. The explicit format b sub n is b sub zero, r to the power of n, and of course b sub zero in some texts they use a. If we add a constant such as a giving uh, medication to patients, then the formula to this one adds c times to this one, I mean. Add c times one minus r to the power of n over one minus r. And as I mentioned, b sub zero in some text, we use a. Finally, we have discussed horizontal asymptotes. By definition, when the limit of f of x as x approaches negative infinity or limit of f of x as x approaches infinity is n, then the line y equals L represents H A, the horizontal asymptote. So that's the synopsis of what we have covered. And now uh, the uh, new stuff. 2.3 limits of functions at finite numbers. Finding limits by numerical graphical and graphical uh, methods. So when we see this, the way again, we have seen it before, the way we read this, the limit of f of x as x approaches a equals n. And the bottom line is that we are getting closer and closer to a, but we never get there. In other words, what happens at a is not of interest to us. Again, this is the summary of the section. All of this will give rise to the equation of a VA or vertical asymptote. If the limit of f of x as x approaches a, or a from the left, or from the a from the right, is either positive or negative infinity. The line x equals a represents v a, vertical asymptote, one-sided limit. The limit of f of x as x approaches a from the left. This is read a from the left. Is n if the limit of f of x as x approaches a from the right is L, then the limit of f of x as x approaches A exists and it's equal to L. If one-sided limits are identical, the limit does exist. Again, we're going to elaborate on that later on. I want you to take a look at all of these graphs and notice when 
we approach A from the left and right, what happens? Here's from the left of A. Here's from the left of A. Here's from the left of A approaching N. Left, left, from the bottom. Left, left, from the bottom. If we approach it from the right, from this side, here, here, the right side, In all cases, as we are trying to get to A from the left and right, we are trying to get to this point, which has the L as the value. And therefore, the limit of f of x as x approaches A in all cases is the same A. What's the difference? In this case, f of A, that means precisely at A, the value is L. So f of A is also L. And it refers to the concept known as continuity because the functional value is the same as the limit value. But if you look at here, f of a, look at this solid point, is whatever this point is. The y coordinate is like b. What about this one? I don't find any solid point. Therefore, f of a is not given to us. We say it's not defined or undefined. So part a, f of a equals l, part b f of a equals b which is not equal to l part c f of a is not even given is not defined but in each case regardless of what happens at a the limit of f of x as x approaches a is l so again pay attention that it doesn't matter what happens at a when we look at the concept of a limit but rather what happens in the vicinity of it if you look at this example and that was the uh, synopsis of that concept graphically we want to find the limit of this, the limit of x minus 1 over x squared minus 1 as x approaches 1 uh, from a numerical point of view and graphical point of view, first and foremost. Uh, notice the function, we're going to call this f of x. f of x equals x minus 1 over x squared minus 1 is not defined when x equals 1. Does it matter? When we look at the concept of a limit, the answer is no. Uh, and the reason it's not defined because the denominator becomes zero. So let's look at a numerical method, which means x is approaching one. We're going to look at from both sides of one, numbers less than one, but close to it. For example, you can go with 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 7, 8, 9, uh, but those are too far, 0 0.99, 0 0.999, so on and so forth. So this is the function. This is x less than one. Plug in those values. And this is what we get. For example, 0.1 gives us this number, 0.9 gives us this number. But this one is the closest one to one, gives us a 0 0.50002. Let's do the same thing from the right side. That means x larger than one. For example, 1.5, 1 1.4, 1 1 1.3, 1.2, 1.1, 1.01, 1 1 and so forth. As you can see, uh, this is a better choice. This is the closest one. And when x is 1.0001, f of x or this becomes 0 0.499975. As you look at this one, this and this, I believe they suggest the limit from the table should be 0 If we look at the graph of this function, as you recall, if there is a common factor between the numerator and the denominator, when you graph a rational function, it creates a hole. So at x equals 1, it has created a four, uh, hole. But look at number 1. From the left, from the right, both of them are moving towards this point, having the value 0 0.5. So, Numerical methodology, graphical, 
they both give us 0.5. But we can look at it algebraically, which is even more important. Please understand, and I remind you, if we plug in, we get zero over zero, which is indeterminate. So if we plug in, we get zero over zero. And the name was in. Determinate. Indeterminate means, as far as I'm concerned, more work, which means use your algebraic. So what do you do when you come across a case like this when it's zero over zero and it's a rational function? Your algebraic technique would be factoring. The denominator is x squared minus one in the form of a squared minus b squared. So that is a minus b times a plus b. So this one is x minus one, x plus one. We can drop the x minus one from the top and the bottom. We get one over x plus one. When we plug in, we get one over two. And that's exactly what we got here. So numerical analysis, graphical, and analytic or algebraic method, they all it was the same answer. Let's look at one-sided limit, and we've already given the definition, but we want to make sure we understand how it's pronounced and so forth. This is h of t. It's called heavy side function. That is equal to zero if t is negative. That means less than zero, and it's equal to one if t is positive or zero. That means t is larger than or equal to zero. So therefore, the limit of h of t as t approaches zero from the right is one. When we say zero from the right, that means t larger than zero. And because the uh, larger sign is here, the answer is one. This is a piecewise defined function. And the way we read it is as follows. The symbol x approaches a from the right means that we consider only x larger than a limit of f of x as x approaches a from the right. On the other hand, the limit of h of t as t approaches zero from the left is zero because t zero from the left, that means t less than zero and the answer is zero. That's why we get that. And the reading is as follows. The symbol x approaching a from the left means that we consider only x less than a, the limit of f of x as x approaches a from the left. And since these two are not identical, according to the limit uh, theorem, when one-sided limits are not the same, the limit does not exist. The limit does not exist. Also, I want you to note h of zero is one because at zero, the equality goes here. Therefore, h of zero is one. And the reason I'm mentioning that for the sake of graphing, if you were to graph it, it looks something like this, everybody. Okay, so we have the t-axis in case for the zero, we have a half line here, half line here. This one has a hole and this one has a solid point, which makes it uh, included. And uh, that is the graph of interest. One-sided limit. So the limit of f of x as x approaches a from the left is n. And limit of f of x as x approaches a from the right is n. Therefore, the limit of f of x as x approaches a exists, and it's equal to n. To make sure we understand this, we're going to look at a couple of examples graphically. So given the graph of a function g, state the values, if they exist, of the following. The limit of g of x as x approaches 2 from the left. The limit of g of x as x approaches 2 from the right the limit of g of x as x approaches to. In other words, we are interested in finding this, and therefore we are going to look at one-sided limits. So, x is approaching two from the left. Let me show you how that is going to work. Here's number two, along the x-axis, here's the left side of that. Along the curve, here's the left side. We are approaching this point, and 
this point has a y coordinate three. X is approaching two from the right. This side of number two along the X axis puts us here on the graph. We are moving towards this point and its Y coordinate is one. Are they identical? No. Therefore, the limit of G of X as X approaches two does not exist e and e does not exist let's look at number five can anybody so if we are interested in limit of g of x as x approaches five we're going to look at the left and right can anybody tell us what is the limit of g of x as x approaches five from the left is number five, the left side. This is how we move. We are moving towards this point. It so happened from the right side of five, we are moving this way and we are moving towards the same point. And therefore the limit would be the y coordinate of this hole, which gives us two in both cases. From the left, from the left, we are moving towards the hole, y coordinate is two. From the right, we're moving towards the same hole, same answer. Therefore, the limit exists and it's equal to two. This limit exists and it's equal to two. What I want you to notice is the following. If this point has coordinates, uh, the y coordinate 1.4, what does it mean? A G of five, see so notice we have a solid point here. G of five is almost 1.4, which is not equal to two. That means it is discontinuous. The function is discontinuous at x equals two as well as x equals five, the difference is and we will discuss that further later on. At x equals two, we have a jump. We can't do anything about it. But at x equals five, if we redefine the uh, function because there is a hole, we can fix it. Also, what is g of two? At two, I'm looking for a solid point. I don't find any. And therefore, um, it's undefined. Let's look at another, another example that involves graph. Uh, we want to find the, the limit of f of x as x approaches two from the left. So here's two from the left. Let me use a different color so it becomes obvious. We are uh, moving towards this point. at this point as a y coordinate three. Uh, can anybody tell us what is the limit of f of x as x approaches two from the right? Is it one? Excellent, so here's what we do. Here's the right side. As we approach two from the right, puts us in this branch of the function. And it's moving towards the hole. Remember, it never gets there as far as the limit. So moving towards this hole, which has a y coordinate one. Since they are not identical, the limit of f of x as x approaches two does not exist. Does not exist.
Now, we want to answer what's f of 2, what is limit of f of x as x approaches 4, what is f of 4. Please understand, f of 2 re refers to functional value at 2 precisely. So at 2, you look for a solid point. The solid point is here. So f of 2 means the y coordinate for this point, which is 3. The limit of f of x as x approaches 4. Anybody can tell us the answer to this one? Whether is it we undefined? No, the limit is not undefined. That is the difference between a functional value and a limit. The functional value, f of 4 is undefined because there is a hole. But when it comes to limit, we are getting closer and closer to 4. We never get there. From the left and right side of 4, here's the left side. Here's the right side. In both cases, we are moving towards this hole. It's not part of the graph and it doesn't have to be. When we are looking at the limit, we don't care what happens at four, but rather near four. So we never get to this point. But as far as the limit is concerned, the y coordinate of this point, which is four, okay? But what is f of four? You look for a solid point, it doesn't exist. So we say it's undefined distinguish between the concept of a limit and a functional value. Those are two different things. Functional value means what happens at that point precisely. Limit says what happens near that point. Okay, two different things. Infinite limits. Uh, this definition is illustrated graphically in following figures, if you look at these two, uh, when x approaches a in both cases, in this case, it blows up to positive infinity. So we say limit of f of x as x approaches a is infinity. In this case, in both sides, both cases, it goes down to negative infinity. We say limit of f of x as x approaches a, a is negative infinity. And we have similar definitions uh, can be given for the one-sided infinite limits limits as follows. If you look at this one, the limit of f of x as x approaches a from the left is infinity. In this case, as x approaches a from the right is infinity. For this one, the limit of f of x as x approaches a from the left is negative infinity. Whereas in this case, the limit of f of x as x approaches a from the right is the same thing, negative infinity and the concept of one-sided limit. And this gives rise to the definition of a VA, X equals A is a vertical asymptote, as long as any of those limits approach negative or positive infinity. In other words, the limit of F of X as X approaches A, or A from the left or from the right, it's positive or negative infinity, then uh, this is the definition of a VA, vertical asymptote X equals A. For example, one of those functions you're familiar with, a logarithmic function, more specifically a natural log with a base e, looks like that. And as you can see, the limit of this function as x approaches zero, but from the right side is negative infinity. And because of this and this definition, x equals zero or the y-axis is our vertical asymptote. Let's look at this graph. Uh, the limit of r of x, uh, we're going to call the function r of x, as x approaches 2, I hope you see that from the left side of 2 or the right side of 2 makes no difference. It's going to go down to negative infinity.
or five makes no difference. Both sides are going up to positive infinity. Now, negative three from the left of it. It's going down to negative infinity. From the right of it, from the right of it goes up to positive infinity. And therefore, according to these limits and this definition of a VA, the VA, this one says x equals two, this one says x equals five, this one says x equals negative three, and this one says the same thing, x equals negative three. Those are the vertical asymptotes. So this x equals two, this x equals five, both of them refer to this. So we're going to write them x equals negative 3, x equals 2, x equals 5. Those are our vertical asymptotes, everybody. Uh, let's switch gears and go to analytical approach. If we plug in 0 into the numerator and the denominator, can anybody tell us what is the value of the top, the numerator? Plug in, what do you get? You get zero because square root of four is two, two minus two is zero. Same thing. And zero over zero, as you recall, it's indeterminate. That's one form, for example, infinity minus infinity, infinity over infinity, those are called indeterminate form. And the way I'm gonna translate that for me, more work. What does it mean? some sort of an algebraic technique can fix this. Or this one is the conjugate, you change this to plus two. So you're gonna multiply and divide by it. So again, first you show it's zero over zero. Then you show the technique is the conjugate. And please understand this fraction equals one. So you're looking at a minus two times a plus two. The answer is a squared minus, I should put b and then first a minus b and a plus b. So a squared minus b squared, which means this square root of x plus four squared minus two squared, and we get this one. X plus four comes out, minus two squared is negative four. A, a common mistake I wanna quickly refer to, if you have two squared, everyone knows it's four, negative two quantity squared, everyone should know it's four. But if you have negative and then two squared, order of operations will give you negative four, don't mix them up. Four and minus four cancel each other, these two cancel each other, they give us one. And if we plug in, now you get two and two is four. So one over four is the final answer. So we are going to be exposed to various examples and various techniques. When we get zero over zero in a case like this, we use the conjugate and we do the math. Now, uh, class, I want to show you, and again, uh, you see some numbers here. They refer to the questions on the exam review as I picked here. X is approaching negative three from the right. X is neg uh, approaching negative three from the left. First, I want to show you, without paying any attention to this, 
So just negative 3. By plugging negative 3, I get what? Negative 1 over 0 in both cases. Now, the numerator really doesn't matter. It's negative 1 or negative 1.001 or negative 0.999. If you have any number, okay, I'm going to remind you. If you have any number, if it's positive, such as 5, both sides of this number are positive. Okay, the left side is like 4.99. The right side is 5.001. It's close to that. If you have a negative number, negative 5, both sides are negative, everybody. Okay? But if you have 0, then left side is negative and the right side is positive and it makes a difference. What difference does it make? When you divide a number by 0, it can go to infinity or negative infinity. You need the sign. And now we are going to approach it properly. Negative 3 from the right class. Here's negative 3, the right side, example is negative 2. So I'm going to so, say, let's say negative 2.9. So negative 2.9 plus 3 gives me positive 0.1. I'm just interested in the sign here, positive, okay? Whereas here, Here, negative 3 from the left. Example of that would be negative 4 or negative 3.1. So negative 3.1 plus 3 gives me negative 0.1. So this is negative. So what is the difference class? Negative over positive gives you negative infinity. Negative over negative gives you positive infinity. That is why you have to figure out whether you're dealing with zero from the left or zero from the right. When it's in the denominator. If it's a numerator class, zero, if you happen to have, if you happen to have zero over some number, it doesn't matter if zero is from the left or right. The answer is zero, okay? But if you have a number over zero, we want to look at it further. Uh, I'll give you another example. Uh, if you just ignore the five from left, from the left and say just e to the power of five over zero cubed, notice the denominator is going to go to zero and now you need to know from the left or right. So when we say five from the left, example is four. So you can even use four because I'm interested in the sign. 4.9 minus five is negative 0.1. So this zero has a, is coming from the left, zero from the left, and it's being raised to the power. Now, re, I'm going to remind you, if you have a number such as let's say uh, minus two to the power of two, you get positive four. But if it's to the power of three, you get negative eight. So the exponent is even here. Negative becomes positive. Over here is odd. So using that concept, when we raise this to the power of odd becomes negative, the answer is negative infinity. To understand this better, I'm going to give you the same question, but I'm going to change the exponent from odd to even. When that happens, Zero from the left to the power of three becomes negative from the left, okay? And from the right becomes positive. Therefore, this is negative infinity, but this one must be positive infinity. So I hope you see the difference between the two.
If we look at this example, uh, generally speaking, if you plug in, you get zero over zero class. But even before you plug in, notice you have a rational uh, expression, and you really should try to put it in its lowest term by factoring. The technique is factor. So even if you don't plug in, you can start factoring if it's possible. The top is very simple, x times x minus two. For the bottom, I'm gonna remind you of the following identities. A squared minus two AB plus B squared is A minus B quantity squared. A squared plus two AB plus B squared is A plus B quantity squared. And these are called perfect square trinomials. So X squared, perfect square of X. Four, perfect square of two. And then if you multiply these two and times two, you get positive for X. Because this is negative, then it's X minus two squared in the denominator. You can drop this one. You can drop the exponent. And now, if you just plug in two, not two from the uh, left, you get two over zero. And again, it really makes no difference for the numerator. You have 1.999, really. But even if you had 2.000001, it doesn't make any difference. But anytime you have zero in the denominator, you have to know whether it's zero from the right or left because you end up with negative or positive infinity. Because it's from the left, we are going to ex uh, you know, come up with this example, let's say 1.9 minus two, which gives us negative 0.1. So it's two over zero from the left and that results in negative infinity. And that's the key that you wanna be careful of everybody. 